You know, being Native American, I lived with a lot of family, such as like my grandparents, my uncles, my aunties, my cousins. And then once we moved to Springfield, it was just me, my mom, my brothers, and my sister. So it was kind of a weird transition to do that because we were used to having so much family around. Kylan Hattie Lucio is 16 years old and now lives in Springfield, Minnesota. The town is just outside of the Lower Sioux Reservation where she grew up. Life was hard for Kylan before the pandemic, and her mom decided the family should move from the reservation. It was hard adjusting to a new home and school. I was still in shock over everything, and the pandemic just made it really worse in a way because I wasn't able to, like, get out and go out to dinner with my friends or something like I would have, or maybe, like, some of the activities that Lower Sioux offers. Some of those things make me happy, but I wasn't able to do any of those because I was just so down in my head and I wasn't able to because of the pandemic. So usually at Lower Sioux, we have these like events that everyone is welcome to. And some of the elders will come out, some of the kids will come out and go to these activities. It could be like going to sweat or it could be like learning how to make a teepee or even just like simple cultural sports like lacrosse. And we weren't able to do any of those things because of COVID. So I think that's what led a lot of people to become like super depressed. And I feel like it was definitely harder on my sister. She's very energetic and she loves going places. And I noticed that now we are having a tough time with her. With my brother Takoja, I feel like he got more sad and depressed than anything. I feel like him not being able to see his friends or go to school was hard for him. I think that might also have affected my mental health during this time because I was so worried about everyone, especially my mom because she was doing it all on her own. I mean, we did have my grandparents, but we were always going out, so we didn't really want to be around them too much because if we were to get COVID, we didn't want to pass it on to them because of the pandemic. The title is Zikala Sha Wea by Kylan Hattie Lucio, and it means red bird woman, which is also cardinal woman. I am glad I get to teach my younger siblings and cousins the right path. I can help lead them to the red road. The red road in native culture is the positive and sacred path, basically the good path of life. I have four siblings in order. They are Takoja, Hayden, Samia, and Tokala. I don't live with Hayden and I barely see him because we have different moms but the same dad. Takoja means grandchild in my language. He is 13 years old currently. Samia is just a name my mom loved because it's kind of like her name, Sammy. Samia is five years old and looks like my mini me. Tokala means fox in my language. Tokala is two years old and he looks like a mini of Taco. Taco is Takoja's nickname. I love my siblings so much. I hope I am a good role model for them. I prioritize school and my mental health so I can hopefully be that good role model. I plan to graduate and go to college to be a teacher, a therapist, or a writer. I would love to teach young children art. I would also love to be a therapist to help people with their mental health. My childhood was good, but there were a couple bumpy roads. Kylan's Bumpy Road be featured in upcoming episodes of The Ism Youth Files. All right. So yeah, my piece is called COVID. We went through that. And it means, honestly, like a multitude of different things. Jernia identifies as mixed race, and she lives in Mystic, Connecticut. She wrote her piece originally in the summer of 2020. She was in the theater camp as a youth counselor and was assigned to write a monologue about her COVID experience. I was basically just assigned this. I actually didn't really want to at that point it was like everything i was almost like ignoring what was happening because it was so present and real at that time still he and i were separated for three months 
On my side, I breathed shared air within four walls. And on his side, his breath was filtered through a P-100 respirator mask for 12 hours on end. He was one of the lucky ones, my mom says. He used his resources well to get that gas mask. And his resources weren't from the hospital he had thrown his life at. I remember the day well, when he sent us a picture of him all decked out in his new gowns, dressed all the way down in multiple layers of armor cloth of polyester. And all I could conjure was, this can't be real, is it? Where I don't get the heroic stories of nursing from my dad, I get it from my friend, whose mother is also a healthcare worker. She remembers when it first started, her mom said, don't worry about it. But then her mother watched all of them die right there in those hospital beds. Those three million people. Summer of 2020, worldwide deaths. Three million out of 7.7 billion. 7.6 billion left. Though it's a small drop, it's a drop nonetheless. Why do I feel like nobody is really talking about that? We weren't ready for it. She said her mother made them as comfortable as she could while she held each of their hands and felt them slip away while they reached for their strangled last breath. Our parents, nurses, doctors, and surgeons are living, breathing warriors, troops, and saints. But that sure as hell didn't come without its pains. Though she worried about her father as an essential worker, Jernia says she had some survivor's guilt. She actually enjoyed being at home during shutdowns. At the beginning of at least when COVID hit Connecticut, so when all of our schools started to close down and I actually, you know, went distance, I actually went into a big, what you could call a spiritual awakening, or really just kind of like a wake up call. And I actually, it kind of revamped my whole person and that, that's really the positive side of it. I went through like many, like clearing out many blockages of my life and really just becoming my full and embodied self. And I continue to this day during the pandemic and quarantine at our home from school. It was, uh, you know, sitting in front of a computer for maybe a couple hours then a lunch break. We actually, for my school, had a two hour lunch break. It was beautiful. Loved it. I, I didn't have my license at the time, but, you know, I would I would go out for walks where I could then go outside. It was lovely during the summer. I did a lot of yoga, meditating, just like resetting myself. I am definitely just like, in general, a work from home person, I'd say. And yeah, the only people that were supervising me were my parents. Trini Fang, now 17, lives in Crystal Lake, Illinois. She says she also thrived during at-home learning and found more inclusion in online communities. When I was younger, I don't think I noticed it as much, but since the pandemic, when I had been online a lot, I had also been in a lot of spaces where there were a lot of Asian people, like more than I had met in person before, and getting to talk with them a lot about so many things and being around like a very easily diverse community kind of raised my awareness that this wasn't exactly something normal or something like my feelings before. I had always felt like it was maybe normal to kind of not so easily admit something about your culture because you worried it'd be different from others. But after the pandemic, I kind of realized that it wasn't normal to feel like excluded. Trini wrote about that in her essay, How We Speak Our Truths. There was something unique about this form of communication. For the first time, I was talking with people who might look like me. I've lived in the suburbs all my life. My neighborhood is quiet, peaceful, and incredibly white. I could count on my fingers the other Asian people in my school, and I rarely ever got the chance to talk with them. Online was different. I met so many BIPOC people, including other Asians like me, and they made me feel like I wasn't alone in a way I never experienced before. When in-person events were shut down, I found myself reaching for something, anything else that could fill that hole of interaction. And yes, online communication filled the void at first, but it grew beyond that. I confessed secrets about myself I hadn't before, and realized truths to myself I hadn't quite connected. All the while, a supportive community stood behind me, encouraging me to continue growing and expressing my truth in all the ways that I wanted and deserved. 
Of course, it wasn't the same as in-person communication. The friendships I made online at that time are bonds I want to keep forever. We were there for each other at our worst, and they taught me to climb up from that hole. I learned to be a better person. We taught each other about the world, sharing comments from other people that hurt us or the things we observed that cut even deeper. Those conversations, more than anything else, showed me I have a duty to the people around me. Even if I don't understand their experience, especially if I don't, I want to make sure I show love above all. This comes with watching my boundaries, respecting labels, and most importantly, reaching out to make sure others feel comforted and at ease. While we were all stuck at home, I began practicing the ways in which I could be a better person to others. I learned where I stood in the world, and it was not to step over someone else, but to share my space with them and ask for mutual respect. Mutual respect. Youth would be asking for that for themselves and for the world around them on the next episode. Tune in for World on Fire. We'll hear more youth tell us about how they changed during the pandemic and how they spoke out for social justice as they maintained their mental wellness. This is The Ism Youth Files. For more info about this project and the book, Speaking Our Truths, visit MediaRights.org. I'm DeAndre Avant.